today's lecture, we're going to talk about the practical applications of Heidi Weinberg. Last time we talked about the principle. Today we're going to talk about the practical applications. So we can use Heidi Weinberg whenever we're trying to estimate uh, the uh, frequency of alleles in a given population, right? And look to see if we want to test that population uh, for a given genetic abnormality. And you can envision that this is really important. The reason this is important is because, um, you know, we, we don't have the facilities or the resources to test every single person for every single genetic abnormality. However, if we can screen certain populations, right, certain ethnic groups or certain racial groups, uh, and if we know they have, if we use Heidi Weinberg to determine they have a certain amount of uh, increased risk for a certain type of disease, then that could be a disease that we uh, screen for in their population. So uh, this is an example of cystic fibrosis. Uh, it's an example, uh, it affects about 1 in 2,000 people. Uh, cystic fibrosis actually is uh, very common in uh, certain Caucasian populations. Uh, and what we want to do is we want to say, how do we know what percentage of people are homozygous dominant and heterozygous, so heterozygous uh, for this abnormality? Uh, it's passed on in an autosomal recessive fashion. So the reason I don't have how do we know how many homozygous recessive individuals are there is because, well, we know. We can tell, right? We can see the phenotype. But it's the heterozygous and the homozygous dominant we're not sure of. So there's molecular tests available, but it's impractical to test everyone. So we really got to look at uh, you know, certain uh, populations. Okay. So let's use the information at hand. This is how you would do a problem like this. Let's assume we have a population that's in Heidi Weinberg equilibrium. Uh, so Q squared, right, is little a, little a. If we want to figure out the frequency of the recessive allele, the frequency of Q, then what we would, we would do is we would say, okay, uh, let's look at uh, the square root of the frequency of AA. So if we take 1 divided by 2,000, it's this number, right, 0 0.0005. The square root of that is 0 0.02, and that is Q. Okay, so let's go on to the next uh, next part of this problem. Once we have Q, then we could figure out P, right? So P equals 1 minus Q, so 1 minus 0 0.02 equals 0.98, okay? So we know what P is now. Then what we could do is we could say, okay, what's the, uh, the frequency of the homozygous dominant individuals? So P squared, 0.98 squared is 0.96. We can figure out the heterozygote, 2PQ. If you do the math, we get 0 0.0392. And we could figure out, okay, this is the frequency of the heterozygote. Whenever you do these problems, the frequency of the heterozygote is the key. You might say, why is the heterozygote so important, uh, you know, as opposed to the homozygous dominant individual? Well, the heterozygote is important because they have a normal phenotype, so we can't tell them just by looking around the population, but they're carriers, right? So they have the ability to pass on the abnormal phenotype if two heterozygotes meet and if they breed. And that's why we really look at the frequency of the heterozygote in determining if we should have molecular tests available for a given population. So this is a practical application of Heidi Weinberg. Okay, what factors can uh, disturb Heidi Weinberg? That's something we want to focus on. What can disturb Heidi Weinberg? Well, remember we talked about the definition of Heidi Weinberg. The population is just eating and breeding, eating and breeding. There's no external forces. Uh, it's a theoretical, right? But what can disturb it? Well, non-random mating can disturb it. Uh, mutation, migration, genetic drift, uh, something called natural selection. We're going to look at each of these. Uh, mutation, migration, I think we know what those are. Uh, non-random mating would be, uh, again, if the mating you know, isn't completely random, and random means that you're, you don't care about geography, you don't care about, uh, let's look at humans, you don't care about uh, ethnicity, you don't care about race, you don't care about socioeconomic status. You can tell human mating is hardly non-random, right? Uh, so um, anyway, uh, sorry, it's hardly random. <laughs> so it's, it's very non-random, right? So that, that's a disturbing force uh, in Heidi Weinberg equilibrium. Uh, genetic drift is whenever you have low populations, very, very small populations, the role of chance increases compared to the role of natural selection. Genetic drift is basically fixation of alleles due to chance. In other words, if there's a big A and a little a in the population, the population could become fixed. It could go all big A or all little a due to chance alone. And we don't really want that to happen, right? You want a population to be able to respond via natural selection to its environment. So all of these are actually disturbing forces to Heidi Weinberg. Let's look at these. Let's look at non-random mating, first of all. So when we have non-random mating, there's different types, right? There's something called uh, positive assortative mating. That's the tendency of like individuals to mate. And like could be whatever you say it is, right? 
uh, ethnicity, race, geography, uh, socioeconomic class, whatever it is. Obviously, we focus on the genetic part of it. Uh, negative assortative mating is the tendency of unlike individuals to mate. The extreme of each of these is these two down here. The extreme of positive assortative mating is something called inbreeding. Uh, inbreeding is when all the genes are affected, right? So mating between siblings, that's, you know, our first cousins, is something that's very undesirable, uh, not only socially, but genetically. Uh, outcrossing is the extreme of negative assortative mating. So it's the avoidance of mating between related individuals. The avoidance of mating between related individuals. Okay, so if we have two individuals, uh, we got to say, are they homozygous by descent or by state, if they're the same? This is what I mean by this. You know how we could have big A, little a, right? Um, that's only if we have two alleles in the population. This diagram showing you, each of these diagrams is showing you a given gene, let's call it gene A, where there's four alleles in the population. So instead of saying big A, little a, we can't do that, right? Because what else would you say? Like sort of big A, sort of bigger A? You can't say that for four alleles, right? So instead of saying big A, little a, they're saying A1, A2, A3, A4. You sort of get the idea. So don't let that nomenclature throw you. Uh, it's just there's four alleles in the population. So what they're saying is this, you know, which of these individuals are we more concerned about? This is A1A1, but this is A1A1. Well, they're the same genotype, right? So for this given gene, they're the same. Um, what we really are interested in are the other genes. And what I mean by that is by the other genes, I mean, um, if you look at this, uh, these alleles here are identical by descent. This is where inbreeding happens. And this is a negative thing. When we say identical by descent, what we mean is they're A1, A1, but if you track those A1s through the lineages backward, since there is inbreeding, they actually got the A1 from the exact same person, you know, several generations back. You might say, why is that bad? Well, for A1, A1, or A1, A1, it doesn't matter, right? I mean, it doesn't, it's not any worse. But we're concerned about the other genes. If they are homozygous for this particular gene, you see how it's very easy, easy if inbreeding, right, that they got two other alleles from this individual for other genes. So they can be homozygous for other genes too. And that's why multiple defects could come through in this organism. If something's identical by state, all we mean is A1 is the same as A1, but see how the different colors here? The red A1 came from this, what, uh, great-great-grandfather. Uh, this A1 came from this great-great-grandfather. So again, they're A1, A1. For the A gene, these individuals will have the same phenotype. That's not an issue. But we're looking at the other genes. And this individual has a very low probability of homo being homozygous uh, for other genes. Uh, you know, I mean, it's just chance, right? But there's no inbreeding. So it's not like we, ha we think they have a higher chance of being homozygous for other genes. Whereas this individual, we do expect them to, be, uh, to have a higher chance of being homozygous for other genes. Okay, uh, how do we measure inbreeding? Well, there's an inbreeding coefficient, ranges from 0 to 1. 0 is no inbreeding at all. Right? So there's no genetic um, relatedness. One is the ultimate inbreeding you can have happen, or the maximum. And one is actually um, self-fertilization. So humans can't even achieve one, right? but some organisms can. Um, what's the effect of inbreeding on the heterozygote? Right? We care about the heterozygote. Not our, only are they the ones that could pass along a defect, but they're the ones that have the highest genetic diversity. Right? They have big A, little a. So we're most concerned about the heterozygote. What's the formula? The frequency of heterozygote, according to Heidi Weinberg, is 2pq. But now what we have to do is we have to add to that formula, right? We have to go minus, and we have to have basically a, a, a possible or potential pen penalty for inbreeding. So we have to say 2fpq. So we just inserted the f here. So notice what happens if there's no inbreeding. Frequency of heterozygote is 2pq minus, if there's no inbreeding, this is 0 here, so it's minus 0. So it's just 2pq. It's not a problem. But what if there's complete inbreeding? What if there's self-fertilization? It's 2pq minus 2 times 1 is just 2, right? So 2pq minus 2pq gives you 0. So what it's showing you is over time you're going to lose the heterozygote if there is inbreeding, or complete inbreeding. This is just showing you the effect on other, uh, other uh, genotypes, but we're most, most interested in the heterozygote. Okay, let's look at this a little bit more uh, to understand the effect of uh, inbreeding on Heidi Weinberg. Uh, what this is showing you here is just a different depiction of the same thing I showed you on the last slide. It's just saying as the generations go through, if we have self-fertilization, we're going to lose the heterozygote. Right? It's going to plummet over time. And we're going to get fixation of alleles. Uh, so in other words, we'll get fixation of the homozygous dominant and fixation of the um, homozygous recessive. That's something that's not desirable. 
this diagram on the right adds to that a little bit. And so what this is showing you is this is showing you that um, the degree to which we get fixation of homozygotes in a population, uh, the speed of that happening depends on the amount of inbreeding that occurs. So if we have complete inbreeding, F equals 1, you can see that we're getting fixation after, what, like six generations. If we have mating between siblings, the F of that is really 0.25. So if it's 0.25, you can see that, you know, even after 15 generations, we're not quite getting fixation. No, we are getting, I mean, we're getting close to it. Uh, if we have mating between first, first cousins, the F is 0 0.06. Uh, and again, you know, that, that asymptote would not reach 100 for many, many, many more generations. Uh, all of these are negative scenarios, but you can see that the gr degree of inbreeding really affects how fast we're getting fixation. Okay, another thing I want to show you here is a little math here that you should be able to do. So uh, what this is, is uh, we're looking at the effect of mutation on Heidi Weinberg. There's some things I want to mention here. So uh, we're considering a population with different alleles, right? So we're considering the allele P on the left, the allele Q on the right. And what we're saying is sometimes P might turn into Q. That's the forward mutation rate. We describe that by the Greek letter mu, or mi, right? But a lot of people say mu. There can be a reverse mutation rate too, right? But let's consider the forward first. So if we have a forward mutation rate, the change in Q equals mu times P. In other words, the higher the mu, the higher the Q, right? Because the higher the mu, the more, um, the more, the faster, excuse me, the faster P is going to turn into Q. So that's one formula we want to put up. Let's look at the reverse mutation rate. In the reality, Q can mutate back into P, right? And we're only considering two alleles for Heidi Weinberg, so we work in, we're confined to that. But the reverse mutation rate is described by the Greek letter nu, or correctly, it should be ni, but a lot of people say nu. And so if we add that in, we have to extend this formula. And this is really the one right here you want to know. This is a complete formula right here. So changing Q is now a function of both of these, right? And you could see that if we're increasing nu, Q is going to go down because the reverse mutation rate is faster. You know, Q is going to turn to P faster. We should be able to change any of these parameters. So if you look at it mathematically, it's sort of the easier way, actually, if you're able to memorize that formula, you can just say, if I change Q, what's going to happen? If I change P, what's going to happen? If I change mu or nu, what's going to happen? But you could also look at it by just uh, looking at this diagram. And you should be able to look at it that way, too. And what I mean by that is this. You have to really think of this a little bit, because sometimes it won't make sense exactly. So um, whenever we make a change, you want to think what's going to happen right after that change, like a split second afterwards. So in other words, if we increase mu, we're going to get a higher Q and a lower P, right? Because everything, you know, forward mutation, P is turning to Q faster. Okay, that makes sense. If we increase nu, Q is going to turn to P faster. So we'll get a higher P and a lower Q. But what if we increase P? What happens to Q? This is where it doesn't make sense exactly, but once you think about it, it will. So if we increase P, you might say, well, increase P, Q has to decrease, right? Well, not exactly, because if we increase P, we want to think a split second later, right? If we increase P, well, there's more P to turn into Q, right? So if we increase P, actually Q is going to increase a split second later. The opposite is true for Q, right? If we increase Q, really what we're saying is we're going to increase P, right? Because a split second later, there's going to be more Q to turn into P. Um, anyway, if you have trouble wrapping your head around that, let me know. We could talk about it further, but, but that's something that you want to look at. You know, if we change one of these variables, what happens next? The reason it's a little confusing is because we have this cycle here, right? It's sort of cyclic. Uh, and eventually what's going to happen is we're going to reach an equilibrium. If we put math to this, if I gave you actual numbers, now I'd have to give you these numbers. You can't just pull them out of thin air, but if I gave you actual numbers, this is actual data from an experiment from your text, you can see that, one thing I want to point out here is that the change in Q per generation, so this is changing Q per generation, this number, actually is quite low. And what it's showing you is that, yes, mutations are important for evolutionary change, but the amount that a given muta mutation uh, contributes to change in allele frequency in a population each generation is actually very, very small. Uh, environmental change is something that contributes much, much more uh, uh, quickly to evolution than do mutations. And that's something that you really should think about in terms of our modern society, right? The, the manner in which we're changing the environment so quickly. Okay, this is again just a t uh, pictorial version, right, or a schematic showing that eventually, right, uh, we're going to reach an equilibrium here. Eventually we're going to re reach an equilibrium. Okay, let's talk about migration a little bit. So when we talk about uh, migration, 
uh, what we're saying is say some statements here. So I'm not going to ask you the math on the migration, uh, the mutation I'm going to on the previous slide. But here I just want to focus on the, on the theory of it. So I want you to know these points here. So what we're saying is we have two populations, right? Uh, we have little a allele, we have big a allele, right? And then we have population one, population two. And so what happens is basically think of it this way. If we have migration and we have these two islands basically here, and there's you know exchange of alleles back and forth, there's some statements that you can make. So what happens? Migration prevents populations from becoming genetically different, right? So it prevents populations from becoming genetically different from each other, in other words. So if these populations aren't isolated and you get exchange of alleles back and forth, yeah, they could be different to somewhat, right? But if there's change, if there's change in alleles back and forth, uh, you're not going to get uh, that isolation where uh, these become two species. That's not going to happen, right? Because you get that flow back and forth. Also, what you could say based on migration is that it increases genetic variation within a population. In other words, if this was an island and there was no exchange, eventually we'd probably get a fixation of one of these two alleles, you know, little a or big A. However, that's not going to happen if we have influx of migration from population 2 into population 1. And so migration increases genetic variation within a given population, right? Although it keeps the two similar to each other. Again, we're not going to go through the math here, but just want to put it up there in case you're interested. Okay, so let's use Hardy-Weinberg to understand that concept of genetic drift. Remember, genetic drift is basically saying we have a small sample size, and so we're likely to get fixation of alleles by chance. What I'd like you to do is look at this diagram. This is generations on the x. This is basically the frequency of Q, right? So this is no Q. This is 100% Q uh, for the allele. And then these are the manners in which Q is changing in five different theoretical populations. I want you to think, which of these populations do you think is the smallest based on this data? So go ahead and think of that. Which of these is the smallest? If you said population 1 or population 5, you are probably correct, right? Uh, in fact, if you really look carefully, maybe it's population 1. Why are we picking them as the smallest ones? Well, they're the ones where, by chance, we're getting fixation of alleles. The reason I said 1 might be smaller than 5 is because it's happening sooner in 1 than, than in 5. Which one's the biggest population? Probably this one here, right? Probably population 3 because it's able to withstand that flux and we're not getting fixation of alleles. So three statements about the effect of genetic drift. Uh, number one, random, it's random changes in allele frequency. Uh, two, it reduces genetic variation within a population. So genetic drift is not a desirable characteristic. Uh, it increases the genetic differences between populations, right? So you get speciation happening. Uh, if two populations become isolated, you get genetic drift uh, that affects each population differently. Okay, some final thoughts on this. Um, how do we use Heidi Weinberg to understand the effect of natural selection? This is sort of one way we can use it, right? We've got to talk about the word fitness. So I'm going to pretend to draw on this slide. I'd like you to draw on yours just to make sure that you get this. But what I mean is this. If we're talking about fitness, fitness is the number of, uh, the number of um, uh, children you have, right? So the number of organisms, the number of offspring that are produced. And so what happens here is that fitness, uh, let's indicate it by a little f. Okay, so just draw a little f here. The fitness of an average individual in a population would be a little f. Now, what if we have uh, some characteristics like altruism uh, or selfishness in a population? And this sounds like we're getting into like you know sociology here, but, but this is a mainstream area of biology that many, many articles have been published on, uh, especially in the theoretical biology. So if we have the fitness of an average individual, it's going to be f. So just write fitness of average individual equals f. If we have the fitness of an altruistic individual, it's going to be F minus B. B is the benefit they give another organism, uh, whether they give them a food resource or something like that. Now you might say, well, F is children minus B. What is it, like five kids minus a sandwich? That doesn't make sense, right? Well, keep in mind that the benefit is not saying, like, what did they give away per se, but it's saying whatever they gave away, what's the net loss in terms of number of children they have because they gave that resource away? So regardless, what you can see is that the fitness of an altruistic individual is going to be F minus B. It's going to be less than the average individual, which is just F in that population. Let's look at the selfish individual. So go ahead and write selfish here, right? If we have the selfish individual, it's going to be F plus B. They're the ones getting the benefit, right? And so you look at that basic data and it says, okay, who's most fit? Well, the selfish individual is, right, it seems like. And then a lot of people say, well, how could something like altruism have evolved uh, in our species?
And when we say altruism, we just mean in a biological context, just an organism doing something for another organism that benefits them, that benefits the other organism. Uh, we don't mean in a soci sociological context where we're saying, you know, what if they're expecting something in return, you know, like food in return or something like that. Uh, we're not considering that in a biological situation. Um, so basically it says, well, how could altruism have evolved? Because they're the least fit out of the three phenotypes. And a lot of people, what they think happens is, yeah, one-on-one, -on -one, you know, mano y mano, one organism versus another, the selfish one is, um, is going to be more fit. But what they think is that altruism might have evolved in a small, isolated population. A uh, small, isolated population where, uh, as a group, altruistic organisms could survive better than a group of selfish organisms because there was reciprocation, you know, uh, sharing of food in difficult times and droughts, etc., uh, so that's sort of, uh, you know, basically how people think that might have evolved. Uh, it's really analogous to something called kin selection, if you ever heard of that term, kin selection. Okay, so those are some practical applications of Heidi Weinberg.